I'm going to follow now with a uh, little brief primer about what our group has been working on in the world of um, AI and precision health. Now, I will say I'm representing uh, a team of three other individuals, Daniel Chow, Leslie Thompson, and Suzanne Sandmeyer. Um, I uh, oftentimes get thrown into these kind of things because I'm the single person that sort of straddles the different uh, spheres of data science and computer science and uh, and medicine. So uh, anyways, you guys get me today, but hopefully we'll, uh, you know, this is basically reflective of everyone's uh, hard work. Now, I will start by paying tribute to this idea of team science, right? Like my colleagues before me, um, by just highlighting a little bit of, of sort of our vision and, and, and the way we've sort of built this new um, center. Uh, now, now, very broadly speaking, the goal uh, is simply to develop and integrate new forms of AI and machine learning into healthcare with a focus on that translational component where we put tools uh, into the hospital. Uh, I'm a physician, right? So at the end of the day, what I want to see most out of my tools is for them to actually make it to real life and uh, and uh, help a patient in some way. So that's very important. Now, uh, the first question we oftentimes get is, you know, what's the point of even building an institution or center to begin with, right? After all, most people that do this work, right, you'll have an umbrella of several PIs and everyone's sort of doing their own thing, building models. Um, it's not immediately clear uh, why uh, or what role an institutional center may play. Well, what makes us a little different is that instead of uh, that traditional model, instead of me kind of coming up with ideas and thinking what might be useful or interesting to make, um, all I house is a team of data scientists and engineers and uh, hardware, right? And I ask really the rest of the community to come up with problems, right? I, again, I'm a physician, but really my colleagues and the other clinical specialties are the ones that know what's most valuable and most important. Um, so I rely on them completely to come up with all the interesting questions. And so our goal really is just to lower the barriers for large scale impactful AI work to help everyone else and enable the other teams out there to add a little bit of AI flavor into what they do. Um, so what does that usually translate to? Well, again, instead of uh, a, a single idea or two ideas that some of my colleagues might have who, um, again, it's, it's not impossible to build AI algorithms, right? Over time, they will find a way um, to get where they're going. But hopefully, right, with sort of the infrastructure and the team and the people that we've set up, we're able to translate on those ideas much more efficiently, right? And, and really see these tools um, into practice. And, and really what these uh, main pillars oftentimes involve is providing some degree of infrastructure support um, and or knowledge, right, to help people uh, actually tackle these problems with uh, AI and deep learning. Now, I will uh, quickly point out a little uh, note here on infrastructure, right? So it's not exactly clear sometimes um, what that might entail. And, and for those of you that might be setting out on your first deep learning AI project, you might think, well, okay, I'm gonna just be spending a lot of time writing code, right, building that model, uh, running training and validation iterations. Uh, but the truth is, in medicine, if you wanna do this properly, you're gonna have to solve all these other things, right, that don't even involve building a model. Right, there are things like uh, simply uh, extracting data from our hospital system, right? Anonymizing that data and putting it into a sandbox that you can uh, do research with uh, in a safe way. Um, on the flip side, after you've developed the model, right, how are you actually gonna take that model and, and use it in the hospital, right? What are all the different pipes that need to connect in the right way? What are all the regulatory hurdles that you need to think about, right, to make sure patients aren't being put into harm? Uh, so that part is, is extremely challenging, I will say, and certainly probably too much uh, for uh, a, a small team to really tackle on day one. However, what you'll notice is that all that infrastructure, as complex as it might be, is extremely reusable, right? Only the part where you build a new model is, is what you exactly have to change every time you have a new project. So that was our vision, right? Why don't we just build all of that once, do it well, and offer it to the entire community? Right, so again, if you take nothing else from this, I will say that um, this is an infrastructure that is available to the community. Um, the imaging component is probably the strongest part of it, but we have other uh, non-imaging data available as well. But uh, the bottom line is if, if someone out there needs access to 10,000 patients with some sort of disease process or tumor or stroke, right, uh, you guys can come to us. We'll get that data for you in, in just a few days. And if you need help building the models and doing downstream things, you know, that's what we're there to do, to help out. All right, so what are some things that you can do uh, with some of that infrastructure? So here's uh, an example of a few tools. These two 
I like to highlight um, in, in terms of uh, evaluating stroke, so looking for uh, hemorrhage in the brain and looking for uh, an inclusion in, in a proximal part of the uh, circulation here. Now, what I like about this example is that you see in real time the diagnosis, right? The, the finding itself, while it might be pretty obvious, right, um, may, may uh, not be the most complicated part of the process, but the fact that you had so many patients, right, waiting there in the ER, waiting for uh, a diagnosis, the fact that you can have an AI system go through and automatically do that quickly and identify which patients need the most attention, right, that, uh, in fact, is very valuable. Oop, it's going again. All right. Um, similarly, right, pathology has a very uh, uh, common theme as well, right? It's not impossible for a physician to go through and, you know, estimate cell density or count nuclei, right, and, and if you've high-powered field uh, views, but it would be impossible to do that throughout the entire specimen, right? It's too, too tedious, too labor-intensive. Uh, that's something really only a uh, uh, optimized machine learning model could could tackle, and same with uh, things in, in, for example, optical coherence uh, uh, OCT world. Um, these pathologic specimens, right, there's probably a few thousand images that are being generated from the machine. So even though any single image uh, could be evaluated uh, with a human without any aid, um, trying to uh, evaluate an entire stack of thousands of images could be very challenging. Now, of course, uh, uh, the power and the lure of AI of course, is to try to do things humans cannot do, right? Um, and so here's a few examples of that. Uh, in this project, we trained an AI system to look at raw CT data, which is a relatively low tissue contrast type of uh, modality, and try to predict which areas have infarcted, right? Which areas the, the brain tissue has died based on some gold standard MRI imaging, and what the uh, deep learning model was was able to extract and essentially understand is how perfusion, right, perfusion dynamics in different parts of the brain at each voxel correlate to uh, a tissue infarct and was able to actually generate these maps with a, a reasonable degree of fidelity. Here's an example now moving into the world of brain tumors where we train an AI system uh, not only just how to identify mutations, like whether they could predict them, right, but also to show us what it learned after it finished training. Right, after looking at hundreds and hundreds upon tumors, uh, the, the deep learning system was actually able to go through it, pick out why was it that it thought the, the patient had an IDH mutation or a 1P19Q code deletion, and uh, generate really the, the first atlas completely curated by a machine learning algorithm, uh, highlighting you know, the, the variety and heterogeneity of brain tumors. And then moving even further now into the world of, of personalized care and, and uh, personalized medicine, uh, this is an example of a project looking at uh, treatment of brain tumors. So patients uh, that are undergoing treatment, oftentimes the common problem we have is, is assessing whether or not something we see is, is recurrent tumor or just treatment effect. And, uh, you know, instead of the, the traditional paradigm, which is to binary, kind of split those two together, um, our vision here was to use a, a biopsy calibrated model to estimate the ratio, right? A continuous number of, of how much tissue is, is truly necrotic and how much tissue is viable tumor. Um, really, you know, providing a, a very personalized metric on a patient by patient uh, basis to make uh, treatment decisions. And finally here, my last slide, uh, you know, those of you in the audience that have been paying attention, you might have seen now slides from uh, radiology world, from pathology world, um, and, and, you know, the clinicians out there certainly uh, are thinking about those, uh, you know, just uh, straightforward demographic risk factors and, and non-imaging covariates. Uh, but of course, right, the, the, the real uh, uh, sort of uh, goal of all this one day is to combine all that data. Right, right now, we, we do do a lot of analysis on a single modality because it's very challenging to uh, go across the different uh, worlds. But in fact, with, uh, with deep learning, with, with sort of the latest machine learning models, this is something that's very feasible. So uh, anyways, that's all I've got here. This is my contact information, and more importantly, uh, the, the information about our center. Again, the uh, invitation remains. Anyone out there that wants to kind of chat and, and work a little bit more, feel free to reach out. Thank you. <laughs>